So for those who came in late, I am substituting for Maggie Moon, Laney Ross from the University of Chicago. So the talk I'm going to give today, so since Bill wants us to change codes and, and the whole way we think about codes, I've decided why not get rid of the whole best interest standard, which is sort of the bread and butter or the primary uh, way we think about pediatrics, because anytime somebody says pediatric ethics, they say the best interest standard. So I'm going to argue that the best interest standard is not the best standard for pediatric decision making. Um, and so I want to look at the role for best interest in medical decision making, but I'm going to limit my talk to children who are members of intimate families. So I'm not talking about children who, um, who are uh, in foster care or anything of that sort. By intimate family, I refer to a relationship of two or more individuals in which at least one is an adult who is capable of and responsible for providing for the primary care and the primary goods of at least one child. So I don't care if it's a single parent home, if it's a uh, two parent home, if it's a homosexual, uh, heterosexual, um, if they're married or not, but at least one adult and one child. And by primary goods, I'm using the uh, concept by roles, referring to um, things such as food, housing, shelter, education, emotional and psychological love. Um, so what is the best interest standard? Virtually all statements in pediatrics begin with that we need to uh, focus on the best interest, which means to maximize benefits and minimize harms to the minor. Um, and this is actually true in the U.S. as well as internationally, true in the uh, child rights standards and things of that sort. But actually, if you think about medical ethics and use the uh, standard by Buchanan and Brock, they talk about four principles. Mark has four boxes. Um, Beecham and Childress have three principles, but uh, Buchanan and Brock have four principles, and they are what are the patient's underlying values. The second is who's the appropriate surrogate, and in pediatrics we presume it's the parent until proven otherwise. They then talk about what principles should guide, and as I've said, historically and traditionally it's the best interest. And then it's the intervention principle, is when should the state intervene? Because for those who want to be paternalistic, you should become pediatricians because we are allowed to override when parents don't make, quote, the best interest uh, response. But in, in America, the guidance principle is best interest, but we have a separate standard for intervention. We talk about the harm principle. And that's really important because what's best and what's harmful, there's a huge gray area in between. Um, in the UK, by contrast, the best interest is used as both the guidance principle as well as the intervention principle. And that was shown very clearly in the case of Charlie Gard. So this was the case of the child with a mitochondrial defect who was dying um, and had, in a sense, exhausted all the medical treatments that were uh, that they had in the UK and the medical team wanted for them to withdraw care uh, treatment and uh, the parents wanted them to continue and actually found an experimental protocol by somebody here in the US and they went and uh, did a uh, GoFundMe page and got 1.3 million pounds and wanted to come over and yet in the UK the doctors went to court saying it is in Charlie's best interest to have the treatment withdrawn. The parent said, we want to take him to the U.S. to get this treatment. And while many in the U.K. said that's a reasonable decision, our decision is best. And they went to court, and the court said, we go with what's best for the child, and what's best is to have treatment withdrawn. And the treatment was withdrawn, which would never happen in this country. Um, and so, and this has happened in many other cases throughout uh, uh, internationally because if you really hold to a best interest standard you really have an obligation not to do what's quote good enough but to only do what is best and then you get into this whole debate about who decides what's best but it's clear um, in the UK that it's the courts that get to make that final decision. So one question to ask when we ask what is in the child's best interest is what interests are we talking about? Are we talking about those self-regarding interests, so interests that are focused purely on the child, whereas for many in the adult world, for example, we'll talk about other regarding interests, interests that we might have in uh, helping our families and things of that sort. We also have the difference between what's medically best versus what's best all things considered, being allowed to consider social considerations, religious considerations, and things of that sort. 
We have to distinguish between short-term interests, what's in our best interest in the next uh, day or two, versus what's in our best interest over the long term. Um, now, outside of the intimate family, one can imagine that we're going to hold decision makers to a very self-regarding, uh, medically focused set of immediate interests. So when we get frustrated by the guardian who's assigned to the 80-year-old, and we all think it would be sort of appropriate to start limiting treatments and things of that sort, and the guardian says, keep going, do everything, part of it is because if you don't know the child and the child or the adult is outside of an intimate household, the only thing we can think about or talk about is what's objectively best. And life is usually better than not life. And focusing on what's best for me is usually better than focusing on third parties about whom I might not have any cares or interests. So that's the difference between talking about what's best within an intimate family versus what's best in sort of a um, atomistic world view. So within the intimate family, I would argue that focusing on what's best for any one individual would be a big disservice because it assumes only one child because once you have more than one child, what's best for one child might not be best for the other. And it also assumes that parents hold this fiduciary role, like your banker is supposed to maximize how much money is in your bank at the end of the day. But parents aren't just fiduciaries. They also have valid interests and needs of their own. So should we hold parents to a best interest standard? Actually, when you look at the literature, most say no. So Buchanan and Brock say no. The best interest should only serve as a regulative ideal, but not as a strict and literal requirement. I also have written that no, because parents' obligations towards their other children, as well as their own legitimate self-interest, can conflict with what's do what maximizes one child's well-being, and that these other obligations and interests may take precedence over the child's best interest. Now, I do hold parents to what I would argue is a Rawlsian basic interest, right? We have some obligations to provide all of those primary goods that I mentioned at the beginning. Erica Salter is a young philosopher um, at uh, St. Louis University, and uh, she argues no, because it's not even clear what interests we're referring to, going back to all those distinctions that I made about what interests we should be focusing on. But if we don't hold parents to a best interest, the question comes in what, in, what standard should we hold them to? And one is from a uh, child psychiatrist named Winnicott, who actually argued for the good enough parent or the good enough standard, that what we need to hold parents to is not what's best, but what's good enough. Um, Goldstein et al. from the uh, child psych uh, group at Yale University argued we hold parents to what he would call the least detrimental alternative, meaning that if you think about what standard we hold them to, we're also thinking about when should we intervene and we should only intervene over parents if that is the least detrimental alternative. So giving parents a lot of leeway until they hit sort of the harm principle of abuse and neglect. Um, and actually, Dikema literally calls it the harm threshold. So basically, we have this problem because we have the best interests, we have abuse and neglect, and we have this whole region in between good enough, and that's going to, um, we, we have to say to ourselves, if we have principles of guidance and intervention that sort of leave this gray area, how are we going to know when to invoke the, uh, the intervention principle or the harm principle of abuse and neglect? So what I offered in my book, and I have to confess, it took me 20 years to have the courage to reread it. But what I offered then, and I actually would rewrite it in many ways, but actually think I have the principle right, which is a principle of respect for persons. It has two components, which is a negative component, which holds universally that we all have an obligation not to abuse, neglect, and exploit children, but that some hold specific positive obligations to children. Uh, usually we're talking about their parents, so it only uh, holds in particular relationships, compels, compelling particular individuals to provide particular children with the good skills, liberties, and opportunities necessary to become autonomous adults capable of devising and implementing their own life plans. The reason that has a value, um, first I should say, why should we give parents such great leeway? And Buchanan and Brock offer four very compelling arguments. First, because in most cases, it's the parents who care deeply about their child's welfare, know them the best and their needs, and are best able to ensure that the decisions made are going to promote the child's welfare. They also talk about the fact that parents bear the consequences of these choices, 
They also talk about rights of parents, that parents have within limits the right to raise their children according to their own values and to seek to transmit these values to their children. And finally, they argue from a very um, group perspective that the family is a valuable institution and its preservation requires some degree of freedom and privacy within limits to make decisions about the welfare of those who cannot make decisions for themselves. I think these are really four strong. I'd like to add a fifth argument, which is to allow parents to make intrafamilial trade-offs provided that it doesn't sacrifice the basic interests of any child member. And so in a sense, again, reiterating that um, once you have more than one child, the idea of giving the best um, fails because you can't give the best necessarily for all children. So what is the role of the child? First, um, in pediatrics, we presume that parents are the uh, presumed decision maker because the child lacks it. And because even when the child has some degree of decision making, parents are still responsible for their child's well-being. This doesn't mean that parents should ignore their child's preferences. Um, and in fact, one could argue that respecting, respect for the developing and to some degree actualized personhood of the child means that we do have an obligation to listen to them. That doesn't mean, though, that they get the final decision. Um, so the benefit of this model of constrained parental autonomy is it's going to place that arrow at the point of what's good enough versus what hits abuse and neglect so that we don't need to have two different principles. And that's going to be really important because right now we get into these fights about is the parent acting in the child's best interest when we really don't mean to hold them to it um, and yet we really don't want to have sort of just the lowest bar of let's only think about abuse and neglect. So we need a principle that's going to be robust enough to think about what children need for, uh, to flourish as well as when do we need to intervene to help these families. Um, so the, the uh, constrained parental autonomy allows us to identify when good enough is no longer good enough and crosses the threshold into abuse and neglect. And it doesn't require that parents deny or ignore their own interests and thereby promotes the family as a valuable institution for child rearing and self-fulfillment, as well as the institution in which children can develop the skills to flourish. So thank you very much. Hi, Lainey. I, I love that idea, and I did when I read it in your book um, many years ago, and I, I still do. And I, I think you infer this, but it also applies to, I think, um, adult surrogate decision-making as well as child decision-making. Certainly, decisions are made in the context of family. One term I've always struggled with, and I wonder if you could talk about this a little bit, is the use of autonomy when we're talking about making decisions for another. Totally agree. And I, I wonder, I mean, it's it, it almost suggests in this case, and I don't think you mean to suggest this, but that the, kid, the child is a property or kind of an extension of myself as a parent as opposed to sort of this own unique being who I'm responsible for. And it's more about power. And I don't know, that sounds kind of awful, constrained parental power or control, but I, what, I wonder if there's an alternative. If I could rewrite it, I would call it constrained parental authority. Okay. I totally agree with you. Lainey, I'm going to pick up on the autonomy issue as well because the aim was to help the child become an autonomous agent, right? And I think that's an ableist term in some ways for the child with disability who will never be autonomous. I, I'm just wondering if there's another yeah. word in terms of being able to help the child flourish and achieve their maximum potential or self-expression or self-determination without using the word autonomy because I think that we're also talking about weighing the power um, of individuals within the family and who is the most vulnerable. So I really like that, Christy, um, and I like the concept of flourishing. I guess I still want autonomy in that case, so where I totally would rewrite it as constrained parental authority because I don't think it's about the parent's autonomy. I still think we want to be talking about the child's autonomy because so there are two very important values. One is about well-being and flourishing, and one is about autonomy and being able to make decisions for oneself. And I don't want to lose the fact that I do think it's part of a parent's responsibility to actually help their child to be autonomous to the extent that they can. Um, if we only focused on flourishing, it would allow, in a sense, the parents to retain decision-making authority over the child forever. And in some cases, that might be necessary, but in most cases, it isn't. And I don't want to lose that, that that's part of our responsibility, is to, in a sense, give the child the wings to the extent that they can fly. <laughs> 
Thank you, Laney. As usual, rigorously articulated. I wanted to push a slightly different argument, although I, the, the last I, I certainly, of course, agree with. What about those cases, and, and this overlaps with a little bit of what Bill was talking about, where you're in a situation where there's going to be long-term, very different lifestyle outcomes, not necessarily cognitive, but children who are going to have medical complexity, and it is very frequently the case that those um, situations, even super parents are going to have a difficult time fulfilling the basic Rawlsian needs of those children. How do you then understand those parents um, who are typical people but now are in a very atypical situation? And how do you then figure out your framework, especially that what you were saying, positive need for um, allowing to give everything for the child's flourishing, autonomy, whatever word you use? Well, right. So, I mean, again, in pediatrics, maybe I'm not fully understanding your question, but in pediatrics, it does take a village, right? And so the state right. does get to intervene if parents are unable to meet their child's basic needs, even if well-meaning parents, right? right? So we do have services that we can provide for families when they're unable to provide for those basic needs. But, I mean... There are some children who, even in that situation, the parents, for their own reasons or because of the state's lack of resources, as we've just seen, can't do it. And we have set up a system where those families currently have to be identified as being neglectful and for the child to be cared for by somebody else. Is there a different you know, um, moral framework we could figure out that these families aren't able to do the good enough, but they're not neglectful? I, they're either good enough or they're neglectful. You can't, I, I don't see how you can have it both ways. I mean, neglectful doesn't have to be sort of, I guess, I guess what you're struggling with is neglectful seems very judgmental, right? That, that they're failing. <laughs> yeah. And what we're saying is when we say medically neglectful, we can say that they're well-meaning, even, even if they can't Correct. achieve those goals. Yeah, that's so why that's why so I'm not looking necessarily to take custody over these kids, but in a sense the concept of medical neglect is or psychosocial neglect is that they need other supports. Right. But I mean so, practically speaking, we have to take um, we actually have to take parental rights to offer them to another family who can do it. Or we could provide that first family with the resources so that they can get into that good enough standard. That, yeah. Thank you. That, you know, Peter in the previous uh, question said that there might be gaps when you deal with um, individuals with complex disability. And there can be these rules applied in pediatric practice. And then when the child who is now an adult with disability turns 18, number one, the parents are not officially the guardians, and number two, the resources available to that individual with disabilities are not of the same standards. And embedded in all of this is how do you get the supports? There is no right to housing. There is no right for adults to housing. So that if a child who becomes an adult with disability needs housing, you're stuck. And so those are some of those conflicts. And I oh, think, yep, and, yep. and the double standard is that the, at times, the larger context of adult individuals with disabilities is that the state protects them in case whoever is in the current environment isn't doing good enough. But in reality, the state neglects them. And for the families to access support, they have to take on the blame. So, so Mike, I think you're totally right. I, I, the, the model was meant to hold for pediatrics, but as Bill started this whole session, maybe all of medicine should learn from pediatrics. And if we created that world, then we would be looking how we can actually provide support for those who will never get to full autonomy or even just needing some help. So totally agree with you. I'm going to stop questions because I want to say more or less on time. 